It's Christmas Eve. All who believe Santa is here, but once a year, all girls and boys dream of new toys. Soundly they sleep, wishes to keep. You are listening to DBN, Demigod Broadcasting Network, and this is Exploring Olympus. Happy holidays, chickens! Yes, it is I. Your adorable, delightful, delicious, and most importantly, delovely Dr. Sebastian Breckenridge, coming to you from my ancestral home, Breckenridge Hall, located just outside of Windsor, England. As this is my first holiday season with you, my dear, dear listeners, I've decided to start a holiday tradition, a very merry Breckenridge Christmas. Each year, I will share personal stories, holiday folklore, and legends, and anything else that crosses my demented holiday mind. So grab your favorite holiday drink. I shall be grabbing a very tall pour of Royal Loch Nagar 1969 Highland Malt Whiskey. And let's settle down for a long winter's tale. And with a little bit of luck, I won't pass out in a pool of my own sick before this lecture ends. Hurrah! Now, is everyone all comfy? Drink in hand, fire in the fireplace. All the lights must be turned off. Candlelight only. Good. I want to take you back to a time before the public relations and advertising agencies created the modern Christmas, oh, full of noise, blinking lights, and the mad rush to purchase that Christmas gift that will most likely be returned for cash. I'm talking about before Oprah's favorite things, and that damn elf on the shelf! Who put it there? And why is it taking notes? way before a Kardashian released a sex tape, thank goodness. And certainly way before Malaria Trump proclaimed her Christmas wishes by stating, Nobody cares about those bleeping Christmas decorations. Hmm. This was a time when Christmas was at its purest form, and the gift of an orange was indeed a treasure. Scurvy be damned, I've got citrus. Life was indeed hard and depended on something as simple as having enough coal or wood to keep a house warm, and where all there was in the larder was a morsel of bread and cheese to calm the grumbling stomachs of a family in need. And the tradition wasn't about twas the night before Christmas, that whorish tale, but was all about the Christmas ghost story. For you see, my dear chickens, no matter how lovely and bright your Christmas tree is, or how many presents are under the tree, and for the last time, mother, I did not peek, there is always a darkness before the dawn. The same darkness a man leading a donkey with his pregnant bride riding on its back had to travel through as they escaped the horror of King Herod's wrath. Because if there's one thing I know from personal experience, King Herod was the biggest drama queen in history. Jeez, look at her. Kill all the firstborn male children. Phew. The year was 1815. King George III still occupied the throne. The Napoleonic Wars had come to an end, thanks to a decisive victory by the Duke of Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. Everything was calm and quiet. If anything, this Christmas should have been a time of celebration. But, my dears, Rupert, the newly installed Duke of Brackenridge, was going to experience a Christmas that was neither merry nor bright. Well, at least at first. Like many grand estates of its time, the Brackenridge estate encompassed thousands of acres a working vineyard and farm. Remember, our estate is home to the rare Brackenridge sheep, and of course many other farmers and their families, who rent the land from us 
to produce their crops, raise animals, thereby earning an income. Christmas Eve 1815 marked another less known milestone in British history. It was exactly a year to the day that Rupert, the Duke of Brackenridge, and of course my ancestor, had become the new Duke after burying his father, Arthur. Yet, even after 365 days had passed, Brackenridge Hall still remained shrouded in its mourning blacks. The mirrors, statuary, and a lot of the furnishings were made covered in black crepe, and the former Duke's study was locked tight, untouched, left the same as it had been on the day the poor Duke drew his last breath. The rest of the house remained as silent as the grave, except for the occasional rustling of one of the many servants going about their business, and of course the occasional outburst from the new duke, as he spewed profanities, smashed empty bottles of wine, cursed his father for dying, cursed Christmas for showing its yuletide face in his presence, reminding him of his loss and how ill-prepared he was to be the Duke of Breckenridge. Although his father had been known for his kindness, the real truth behind the plotting and social climbing Duke was much more darker. However, when it came to his son, Rupert, Arthur had overindulged him, bestowing upon the lad anything and everything he desired, as some misguided parents of the gentry are apt to do. It was said that the former Duke died of a broken heart, full of resentment, disappointment, and bitterness when he realized what he had done to his son. For you see, although his father, who had cultivated a surface-only facade of kindness, Rupert did not see the benefit in doing the same, and therefore treated everyone with the same disdain and abuse he truly felt for them. It was said his heart suffered from a complete inability of being able to love. Love he considered to be a weakness, leaving a person vulnerable to hurt. He only concerned himself with the business of gold, pounds, and shillings, and his uncaring and somewhat cruel behavior to family, those he employed, and those that depended on his land for their existence, seemed to have no end. In fact, the only person he didn't hesitate to spare no expense for was for himself. And when it came to Christmas, well, allow me to tell you, chickens, when your heart is as hard and black, don't you dare turn this into something dirty. When his heart was as black and hard as his was, there wasn't a way for Christmas to find its way in. On this Christmas Eve in 1815, we find Rupert dining alone in the opulent private club he preferred to stay in, thereby avoiding Brackenridge Hall and its many ghostly memories. Standing next to his table, clearly not invited to partake of the feast before Rupert, was his secretary, Robert, who was rapidly scribbling notes on the orders the Duke was giving to him. Now that we have our tale set, let us begin by establishing one main fact. Arthur, Duke of Brackenridge, was dead, and there was little doubt of this. If one were to ask the undertaker who had witnessed the tragic Paul Bearer's stumble, which shot the poor duke's body out of the coffin and halfway down the church's central aisle, they would all testify that the duke was dead. Well, uh, the priest and hundreds of mourners, made up of royalty and nobility, well, alike would concur with the undertaker, as during the service they had witnessed one of the altar candles fall over and into the coffin, thereby setting the corpse on fire. It was noted by all attendees that the corpse did not attempt to put out the fire itself, proving once again the Duke was dead. Wood would only have to get within smelling distance of the then smoldering corpse to conclude that yes, that is a dead man. Now, this must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of this story I'm going to relate to you. I mean, what would be the point of any vampire story if the vampire wasn't dead? They wouldn't be a vampire at all, but some sort of strange person with a bad biting fetish. And that would not do very well for the Twilight Book sagas, nor the Vampire Diaries. Wouldn't that suck, both literally and figuratively? But <laughs> I digress. Oh, 
how surprising it was for a man who was only thirty years and five to be so cruel, nasty, tight-fisted. Rupert was a scraping, grasping, clutching, covetous man who could squeeze out from each shilling he had two pounds and eight pence. He did this at the peril of anyone who worked with him, borrowed money for him, or worst of all, owed him a favor. His voice, although deep and melodious, was not a joy to hear, as every word that dropped from his silver tongue could cut down even the most innocent of persons he encountered. No one ever stopped to ask after him, and all the beggars scattered when they saw Rupert walking towards them in fear of being swatted away by Rupert's silver-topped walking stick. Even the blind beggar's dog could sense when Rupert was about, and would tug its master's coat and lead them away from the cruel duke. So, where did that leave us with Rupert? Ah, yes, dining on oysters and beef and drinking enough wine to contribute to his constant state of drunkenness. As he cut into his bloody steak, a voice cheerfully cried out, A Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. God save you. It was Rupert's nephew, Fred, who had the annoying habit of being able to enter a room silently and always startling Rupert each and every time he encountered him. For the love of God, man, hasn't someone gotten around to putting a bell on you? And as for Christmas, I say bah, humbug, and I would kindly remind you to address me as your grace. Well, sir, said Fred, his face handsome, flushed, and his eyes sparkling with merriment and mischief. I wouldn't want to offend you, your grace, my sincerest apologies. He said, bowing so deeply, Rupert was sure the man would fall over. Wait, did you say Christmas a humbug? Surely not, your grace. I do, said Rupert. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. What right or reason have you to be merry? You're presently without any decent means, save for the allowance I deem to give you. And I only give you that out of a promise I gave my late sister after you were born. Come now, returned the nephew. You're the Duke of Brackenridge, and vastly wealthy. What reason have you to be such a dismal bore? Bah, Rupert replied, clearly peeved that his nephew had bested him in the conversation. Humbug. Oh, don't be cross, uncle, said Fred. What else can I be? returned the uncle, when I am surrounded by fools like you who go about wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. How is Christmas any different from any other day? You still go about paying bills with my money, and the only thing to be gained by the end of the year is that you are one year older and not a second more richer. If I had my way, each and every person with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle, pleaded Fred. Nephew, returned the Duke sternly. You do what you want with Christmas and allow me the ability to pretend it doesn't exist. Fred, deeply hurt, replied, I would like to believe that there are many things I have done in my life that I have done without consideration of how it will benefit me, including celebrating Christmas. But I do know this for sure, dear uncle. It is this season that allows our fellow man to open up what was previously shuttered hearts and minds to see the goodness in others that they have overlooked, reminding them that they are not alone in this life's journey. So, even though this spirit of goodness offers no profit into my pocket, I will embrace Christmas and rejoice in it. Truly moved and foolishly unable to contain himself, Robert dropped his papers and applauded. I was not aware that you were part of this conversation, Robert. So kindly remove yourself, or you may be celebrating Christmas unemployed. You'll be wanting tomorrow off to celebrate your Christmas. Stealing from me without the decency to feel guilty for it. As you expect to be paid for a day of no work, 
the Duke through the secretary's weekly earnings. A meagre fifteen shillings at Robert. Embarrassed, the secretary picked up his wages and his papers and left. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Why would I dine at your meagre table? when this club supplies me with everything I need. But why? Fred asked. You married too young, said Rupert. I fell in love. Good day, sir. You've always treated me with cruelty and disdain, even before I married. Why make that excuse? I said good day, shouted the Duke. I want nothing and ask for nothing. Why can't we be friends? Good day, said the Duke. I wish there was something I could do or say, for even though your dislike of me is clear, I do know of the love you held for my mother. May she— I told you never to speak of her, as you are the reason she is no longer here. Fred sucked in a breath, shocked. Your words are horribly cruel, uncle and are a slap in the face of the memory of my late mother. But I will not lose hope in you, your grace. I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. His nephew left the room, and to toast his leaving, the Duke ordered another bottle of wine, which he drank greedily. Your grace, cried two rather robust gentlemen, who stopped in front of the Duke as he was being helped on with his coat, hat, and gloves. May I have the pleasure of greeting his grace, Arthur, Duke of... You may not, Rupert stated dryly, as my father, Arthur, has been dead since last December. Oh, my apologies to you, your grace, and may I offer my sincerest condolences. I meant Rupert, Duke of Brackenridge. What business, if any, do you have with me, gentlemen, as I am about to leave and my time is very valuable? Of, of, of course, your grace. As this festive time of year, we men of means are reminded to offer thanks for what we have by making slight provisions for the poor and destitute, whose continuing suffering seems to be greatly increased during the winter months. Well, gentlemen, you have managed to do something few have been able to do. Ruin a perfectly good evening by offering such very sobering conversation. But, but, sir, do not interrupt me, sir. You forget yourself. Are there no prisons or union workhouses? And don't answer that. That was a rhetorical question. Those who would rather die than go there should do us all a favor. And get it over with. Decrease the surplus population. Weak or sickly persons provide no value but to drag us all down. I am also to assume that the treadmill as a form of punishment and the poorhouses are still in full force because this would disturb me greatly should these fine institutions have met an untimely death. You may put me down for nothing, sir, as my taxes, which are great, pay for the before-mentioned institutions. So I say to you and your partner, good day. Clearly, I cannot find any peace, even in my very own club, the Duke mumbled, as he climbed into his private carriage. Brackenridge Hall, he shouted to the driver and settled back fuming at the injustice of Christmas. The journey to Brackenridge Hall did not help Rupert's humor. In fact, the closer he got to the ancestral home, the more his demeanor soured. Dozing slightly, the Duke was jolted awake when the carriage came to an abrupt halt in front of the Grand House's front door. Without a word to the driver, Rupert stumbled out of the carriage and remained still until the carriage made its way to the stables. This miserable pile of rocks, the Duke commented as he looked upon his home. You are a millstone around my neck, pulling me down into deeper waters. He made his way towards the door, failing to notice the ice that had formed on the ground. 
and went head first into the door and its massive door knocker. Feeling a knot swell up on his forehead, the duke rubbed it, glaring at the offending door knocker, but stopped short as he gazed upon it. Although somewhat a simple design, a lion's head, with teeth bared and a ring clenched in them, as a small child he was often frightened by the blackened head, but it wasn't the blackened lion's head that greeted him, but rather it was the face of his father, glowing brightly and glaring down on him. Father? the duke said, as he cowered from his father's gaze, closing his eyes against the vision. When his teeth began to chatter, and he felt quite foolish, Rupert opened his eyes and found the lion's head restored to its rightful place. A humbug indeed, Rupert muttered as he opened the door and stepped in, making sure to lock it behind him. Even in the best of times, Rupert disliked Brackenridge Hall, with its endless packages and darkened corners, historical significance, and ceaseless traditions associated with the house and being the Duke of Brackenridge. The house he faced this night felt dead, which was appropriate since Rupert thought of the place as a very large tomb. I am very drunk. Very... Very drunk, Rupert said, his words echoing back at him in the dimly lit entry hall, the only light coming from the massive stone fireplace that the main staircase wrapped around, almost resembling a serpent crushing the last breath out of its victim before swallowing it whole. Embers crackled, sending sparks into the air, shocking the duke out of his drunken stupor long enough for him to pass out, fall to the floor, and piss himself. He woke up in his bedchambers a few minutes before midnight, stripped naked of his sodden clothes and dressed in his long nightshirt. The beginnings of what he knew would be a mind-shattering headache began to throb, and he moaned while rubbing his temples. A moan answered back, and it was definitely not his moan. He knew his moan. It was a respectable moan, and this other moan... Well, it wasn't his. He sat bolt upright in his bed, the room becoming chilled enough that his breath came out in a vaporous cloud. The sound of heavy change dragging up and down the whole stone floors made him wince. The moaning, not his own, came again as the sound of the dragging change ceased just outside of his chamber door. Three deliberate echoing knocks came. As the fireplace glow grew dimmer, and the room's cold increased to the point that he began to feel nauseous. The sound of his chamber doorknob being tried broke him out of his paralysis, and he fell from his bed and scurried to the door, slamming the lock's bolt in place. He listened. All was quiet. Unsure what to do next, he put his ear to the door, which was now frost-covered. No sound came. Although his rapidly beating heart was noisy enough, relieved, he put his forehead on the door, hoping to numb the ache in his head, but finding little solace. Turning to return to bed, his eyes locked on the spectre of his dead father, glaring at him. I, in life, was the father that left you wanting for naught. You reward me in death by denying me an audience? It's rather rude when you think about it. Well, if you're going to nitpick, the whole door knocker business was a bit much. Not to mention your hideous moaning. Allow me to remind you that you're... Well, you have once again proved that the money spent on your education was money well spent. So let's dispatch with the obvious observations as we have already covered that in a few pages back. I am dead. If I were a parrot, you would have to nail me to my porch to keep me from falling off. If I were not here, floating about, I would be pushing up the daisies. Clearly, which is very dead indeed, Rupert gestured at his father's ghostly appearance. I naturally would prefer you to lie in peace. Peace? 
peace, you say? His father replied, voice rising in anger, while the apparition rose slowly from the ground, his chains rattling as they joined him mid-air. Do I look at peace? Certainly not, father. If uh, anyone were to look upon your overall appearance, they would find it rather resentful, not restful, nor peaceful. A bit dramatic, especially the way you strode your way across the boards in a somewhat Macbeth fashion. <laughs> the ghost burst out in booming laughter. Oh, the other cheek of you, my dear boy. The other cheek. The ghost slowly lowered itself to the ground chains falling with a large clatter for the last 365 days i have traveled the earth and not first class but coach might i add and have witnessed the utter bitterness of my fellow man for those who are in need like many i chose to ignore these miserable sods when it is i who should have lifted them up from their poverty, sickness, and destitution. I and my fellow travelers, we get a group rate on British Airways, are damned to wander aimlessly and bear witness to all the suffering that exists in our world, unable to do anything about it. Sounds rather bleak and extremely common, if you ask my opinion. Haven't you signed up for the ghostly equivalent of frequent flyer miles, so that you can get an upgrade or two? I did not come here to ask your opinion, boy. The chains slammed down in emphasis. Well, aren't you the bossy one still? Well, you're dead and I don't have to listen, Rupert said. You hold your tongue, sir, for my time here grows short. Do you see this chain? This is the chain that tethers me to this spiritual plane of never-ending suffering. Did it come in a little blue box? Standards, sir. We must have standards. A chain created from my failures and regrets with you, my son, and those of my fellow man I should have helped and didn't. I forged each and every link of this chain myself, damned to drag it behind me as a reminder of what could have been and wasn't. Nobody said anything about DIY or crafts. Besides, you were always generous of nature. Generous? <laughs> bah. More like foolish and vain. I turned a blind eye to things that were difficult and required both thought and sacrifice for those that would provide me with instant gratification. And when it came to you, my boy, well, I gave you your heart's delight, forgetting my responsibilities to help nurture the man you could have been. Now see here, sir. It is often said at the club that I need no more nurturing, as I have developed into quite the striking example of manhood, both in length and girth, Rupert protested. I said hold your tongue, the ghost roared, its mouth elongating to the point that it nearly split the spirit's head in two. Time is of the essence. There is still hope for you, boy, but know this, sir. Uh, the chain of selfishness, misery, and callousness that you have wrought was twice as long and twice as heavy as mine one year ago. Is there, is there nothing I can do, father? Rupert begged, kneeling in front of his father to plead. Do not leave me to the same fate as you. The only thing I enjoy that is coach-related is my luggage and gloves. You will be visited by three ghosts. His father began. Wait one moment, sir. If I have any say in this, I would rather drink my spirits. Not be visited by them. Mm, no. Granted, I'd rather not, sir. Perhaps there's some other way. Uh, go going to church or giving my word as a gentleman and a scholar. The ghost shifted 
and was upon the duke face to face, pulling his son into the air. The first ghost will appear as the clock strikes one, and the other two ghosts will appear at strikes two and three. Unclog your ears and mind, boy, and for once in your life, listen. Both of our souls depend on it, and from what I can tell if things don't change, the only coach you'll be able to get will be on public transportation, or at best on the Megabus or Greyhound. And with a quick shove, the ghost shot through the wall and disappeared leaving Rupert to crash down onto his bed and pass out. And, of course, piss himself. Again! Rupert woke up with a start, striking his head against his headboard. It was dark, his fire having given up the ghost. He laughed to himself. <laughs> it was a dream, he said, trying to convince himself, and any misguided spirits, sprites, and fairies floating about unseen in his chambers. A dream! Rupert shouted to the ceiling. Reaching over, he pulled on the servant's bell cord several times. But no one came. He pulled it several times more, and still nothing. Frustrated, he jumped out of his bed and stripped off his sodden clothes and threw them in the corner. He walked to his dressing room, took down another nightshirt, put it on, and strode over, and quite angrily threw another log on the fire and stirred the ambers back to life. When he was satisfied, he turned to climb back into bed. The clock on the mantel struck one. A loud, ear-shattering banging came from the direction of his chamber door. It's about bloody time, Rupert shouted, reaching for a writing crop he kept in his chambers to properly correct any disobedient servants. I'll give you a Merry Christmas indeed. A Christmas you will never forget. In one swift movement, Rupert threw open his door, which slammed against the wall, sending a painting crashing to the ground, and raised his crop. No one stood in the doorway. He took a step into the hallway. It was vacant. And before he could turn around and return to his warm bed, the chamber door slammed shut, shoving him deeper into the darkened hallway. Someone is clearly off one chump, and is in need of a good anointing, the Duke said through gritted teeth. A tinkling giggle came from the other side of the door. What sort of game is this we have here, sir? The duke roared, and kicking the door open, which was rather stupid considering he was barefoot. Standing in the center of the room was a curious sight. A rather tall woman of what appeared to be African origins. He changed his mind. It wasn't a woman, but a man. But then he changed it back, deciding to go with woman. The woman lay across a fainting couch in the center of his bedchamber. Now, notwithstanding the fact that a stranger was in his room, dressed in a rather attractive Grecian gown of white, with a face covered with a large amount of makeup, which, truth be told, the Duke couldn't help admiring the artistry of it all, and the largest mass of curly hair piled on top of her head, bejeweled within an inch of her life. Well, death, I suppose, if it's a ghost. Rupert couldn't wrap his mind around where the hell the fainting couch came from. Do ghosts bring their own furniture when they go out to haunt, he wondered? And where were all of the twinkling lights showering down upon the apparition coming from? The duke fell quite out of place without the customary rave glow sticks in his hand and dog tags around his neck. Oh, my, the ghostly woman said, shifting both her hair and bosom to greater heights and size. Have you come to give me an unforgettable Christmas? I have been awfully naughty and should be punished, the woman pouted. Rupert didn't know what to do or say, for he was held to the spot he stood in by his visitor's eyes. Oh, perhaps I have come to give you one. <laughs> Pray tell, your grace. Is that a writing crop I spy? Mm. And, sir, it would appear you are well tented. <laughs> The duke remained silent and still because, well, he really didn't have much of a choice, now did he? He blinked and the woman was standing in front of him, holding the riding crop and showing off a somewhat 
stubbly cheek and chin. It smiled. Rupert blinked again, and he was on the fainting couch. That wasn't his, with his dressing gown hiked up to his hips and his bare buttocks exposed, the cold air making him shiver and certain parts to shrink. He blinked again, and the spectre was beside him, humming Good King Wenceslas. No, my dear Duke, my time is here is short, which is a shame because I like to take my time emphasizing the importance of Christmas, peace on earth, goodwill to men, and blah, 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 blah. The Duke flinched as he felt the riding crop caressing his left buttock and even finding its way between them. So I'm going to have to make this portion of our time quick and dirty. Twenty-five times the crop was raised and brought down upon the duke's posterior, as the most disgusting vulgarities, some of which the duke, who was a connoisseur of the filthy tongue, had never heard before. Sailors, longshoremen, and prostitutes would have blushed hearing even one-fifth of what Rupert heard, and woven within the profanities were messages of what a wicked, wicked, naughty boy he was. <laughs> the spirit had the decency to ask Rupert several times if he had had enough, which, after the duke's reply of yes, the ghost screamed, no, you haven't. It was not enjoyable in the least. Well, maybe slightly during the first three blows, and Rupert has officially gone on record that even though the spirit kept telling him, this hurts me more than it hurts you, Rupert found that statement questionable at best, or an outright lie at worst. After the whipping had stopped, the spirit told him to clean himself up, for they had some travelling to do, and unfortunately he had pissed himself again. When he had changed into a travelling suit and coat, he said to the spirit who was patiently waiting for him, Are you the spirit, madam, whose coming was foretold to me? No, I'm the highest paid girly man from Mrs. Winslow's House of Pleasurable Coffee, which could be found just outside of Covent Garden. Re the spirit stared back at Rupert, and with great suddenness, blurred for a second as a blow hit the back of his head. Point taken, Rupert said, rubbing his head. I, the spirit said, spinning around and around as the twinkling lights that surrounded her grew brighter, am the ghost of Christmas past. Ta-da! The spirit stopped and posed with arms outstretched to its side. Who's past? Oh, who do you think, King George's? The spirit spat back. Long past? The duke asked. No, your past. My past? Past what? Christmas past, the woman said, growing irritated. Whose Christmas? The duke asked, smirking. Your Christmas! My Christmas, the duke said. Long past? Do you want me to get the riding crop out again? Rupert thought for a few seconds. No, I do not. Your grace, I am here for your welfare. Very kind of you, Rupert said. But I don't believe I qualify for income or housing subsidies. Well, your reclamation then, the spirit spat out, and then gathering herself into a very serious manner, the spirit dramatically delivered her invitation that Rupert believed wouldn't receive a nomination, let alone an Olivier Award. Heed my warnings and walk with me, Rupert, Duke of Brackenridge. For your very soul depends on it, the spirit said as it glided towards the window, which flew open. I'm not going out there, the duke said. I'd fall before you could bestow another one of your brilliant yet compelling performances. Bear but touch one of my supple nipples. Here or here, the ghost said, displaying a somewhat generous bosom. And you shall be upheld in more than this. Shrugging as he did so, Rupert grabbed the right breast, and his feet lifted off the floor. What sort of breaths are these? They're as hard as rocks, the duke stated, wondering how could they be so unforgiving. Birdseed, the ghost replied. What? Never mind, 
And off we go! The two figures disappeared. Brackenridge Hall, the grounds, and the night all blurred out of resistance, and Rupert found himself standing in a snow-covered courtyard of stone, surrounded by many towering buildings that were very familiar. You really are an emotional mess, standing there shaking with tears rolling down your face. We've only just begun! Your therapist bills must be monstrous, the ghost said. Do you recognize where we are? Why, it's Eton, the Duke replied, where I spent so many years living and learning. It is quite deserted. Wait! There is a scrap of a boy that sits alone in his room. Yeah, we can just go ahead and skip this part, Rupert said. I'm good. I think not the spirit said, pushing Rupert through stone walls until he stood in the room. But look, I was mistaken for the boy. He is not alone. Don't worry about being called a total pervy bastard, your grace. These are but memories of the past. They can neither see or hear us. Henry, my closest friend. Ah, well, close would be one word I would use for your friendship with Henry. The other would be, don't you dare, madam, sir, or whatever you are, Rupert spat. He was like a cousin to me. A cousin, yes. Let's go with that. Upon further inspection, I would update the description to kissing cousins. I love you, Henry, little Rupert said in a whisper under the covers. It was common for boys away from home to form these attachments with other boys. Completely natural the duke stated. Yes, it is, the ghost replied. Love is, after all. Love. Promise me we will stay together forever, Henry said, hugging his companion closer, nuzzling his face into little Rupert's neck. I, Rupert began. What have we here? A voice boomed over the two huddled figures. Couple of sodomites. Ripping the covers off the two boys and exposing their nakedness. The housemaster grabbed the boy, Rupert, and sent him flying across the room. I shall have the headmaster contact both of your fathers, whom I will sure will rip out these notions of sodomy out of your minds. Shaking, Henry spoke up. It was Rupert. He forced himself on me. He was, he said, he would see that my family were destroyed if I told you. The duke let out a wail. Why must you show me these things? The duke's younger self sobbing equally, barely able to speak. Is it true? The housemaster asked. Are you a sodomite, Rupert? The young Rupert looked at Henry, noticing the pleading in his eyes. He remembered how, on several occasions, numerous bruises had covered Henry's body because of his father's cruel nature. Yes, the young Rupert said, his heart shattering with each word. It was me. I forced him. Henry, get dressed. Henry did so, as the housemaster grabbed Rupert off the floor and bent him over the bed. I believe some immediate attention is needed for this situation, the housemaster said, grabbing the birch rod he always carried with him. You will thank me when you are older for my generous nature. Henry stood up to leave. Where do you think you're going, boy? You will learn by watching on the dangers of giving into filth like Rupert. If you turn your eyes away, your punishment will be worse by twofold. You didn't deserve this, the ghost said, watching the tear slide down the duke's face. You are betrayed. And still you held your tongue. Yes. I... I did it for Henry's sake, but I deserved it. Because I dared to love someone. I was stupid. Vulnerable. This was my reward. No. Love is love. It is pure. Bah! Rupert said. And what has pure love gotten this younger self? Kicked out of Eden? And a sore ass. No. I think I learned my lesson that love is for fools. 
The room blurred, and the scene changed to a now dressed Rupert, standing alone, looking expectantly out the window. Standing alone, the spirit said. What choice did I have? Rupert said. Sitting was out of the question. The pain was unbearable. I had just managed to stop the bleeding. A figure rushed towards the young man, the sight causing additional tears to fall from the unseen duke's eyes. Dearest brother, the younger girl said, throwing herself into the young Rupert's arms. The motion caused the wounded boy to stumble and hit the wall, screaming out in pain as his buttocks were set on fire again. Oh, Rupert, what have they done to you? She said, holding her brother tighter. I am here to take you home from nasty old Eden. Father has grown so much more kinder. Dearest little Fan, how I have missed you. But there's no facing Father for what I have been caught doing. Father says we are never to speak of it. He loves you, dear brother, she said, wiping the tears from his cheeks. But, and here is where she soothed my pain, a salve for my heart. The duke said to the spirit, bowing his head to listen carefully. I cannot say I understand. I'm ten, after all, and father says such matters are not for a girl of my innocence. Although I think father is a bit silly when you think about it. The girl snuggled closer to her brother. But I know this. I love you to the moon and back. You are my dearest Rupert who has pledged to defend my honor against dragons, wizards, and witch alike. I love you more than my favorite garden pixies. The boy Rupert laughed. Oh, no. <laughs> Not the pixies. I wouldn't tell them about this deep love you have for me, because they are jealous and incredibly vain creatures. But your secret is safe with me, beautiful fan. I will love you, Rupert, forever and ever. The duke watched the two comforting each other as they walked away to the waiting carriage. Oh, he's a delicate creature, and a bit needy in the attention department. Some might say slightly creepy with her somewhat adult manners. Like that one little girl that you always have to invite to your parties, because her parents know your parents. She's the one who collects the most disgusting things, like pasture patties, and always had that one easy-bake oven that never really bakes the cakes all the way through. Are you done? The Duke asked. Well, she was unusual, and so frail. A breath might have withered her, said the ghost. But she had a large and kind heart. So she had, cried Rupert. She was never meant for the cruelties of this world. She died a woman said the ghost, and had children? One child, Rupert returned. True, said the ghost. Your nephew, Fred. Yes, Rupert mumbled. Well, better she went quickly. Those kind of people are such a burden on society, dragging us all down. Rupert winced and turned to reply when in a blink Eaton was gone, and they were in a vast barn. Do you know this place? The spirit asked. Know it? Rupert exclaimed. This is the barn located at Brackenridge Hall. My father had me spend numerous seasons here to understand the physical labors of the estate's main farm. But there was more to it, wasn't there? The spirit asked, slyly, gliding over to pet the nose of a brown and white mare. It's what his father had done to him and his father's father. The spirit held her hand up. Please, squirrel friend, you're not fooling anyone with this grand talk of tradition. He thought this would help you out with your condition. And I'll have you know that I'm using air quotes when referencing your condition. Well, yes, he, uh, he thought it would toughen me up and put thoughts of what happened at Eton out of my mind. Rupert said, petting a Breckenridge sheep that was quietly laying in its hay, drowsy with sleep. Oi, Rupert, are you done with the horse stalls? A voice called from the hayloft. Almost, a 19-year-old Rupert said, walking out of one of the stalls and putting his shoveling gloves aside. Well, 
Look at this young, strapping man you grew into. Mama like the spirit said. You're no better than a fishwife, Colin. Do this, do that. Sweat drenched with hay and dirt clinging in all the right places to his clothes and face. Rupert looked up at the hayloft. I have half a mind to come up there and show you what for. Colin stepped forward into the light and looked down, smiling. Oh, I would like to see you try. Finally, the spirit remarked. Time for some man-on-man slap and tickle. How did that work out? Colin, the duke said, letting out a slight sigh. I said, how did that? I heard you the first time, the duke spat back. He was the most beautiful man I had ever seen. Tall, broad, handsome, and so kind. Yes, I bet your father was so incredibly pleased as you were lusting after the stable boy. I mean, good God, man, this is all playing out as some really bad romantic paperback at best. You certainly were toughening up. A real man's man, the spirit said. I resent that. It may be only the 19th century, but I refuse to allow you to try and force me to adapt to my father's or society's standards. We were two men discovering who we were. I could bale hay with the best of them, keeping up with Colin's brute strength. He was, Colin arched his eyebrow, and proceeded to climb down, walking up to his friend. He took a whiff of Rupert and grinned. Oh, you stink, your grace. Don't call me that, Rupert responded. Besides, I've never known you to complain about a little dirt. (laughs) Colin laughed. That laugh, the duke said to the spirit, would make me weak in the knees. Well, the ghost commented, glancing down at the young Rupert's trousers. Something stood up when he laughed and looked at you that way. And if I might be so bold as to say, Colin was a very lucky man. The Duke blushed. All Breckenridge men are known for their talent, the ghost offered. Well, Colin said, pulling out a few stray pieces of hay from Rupert's hair. You are, you better get scrubbed up and dressed. Old Fezziwig will want you to be respectable. Hush, Rupert said. My father will have you bent over for fifty lashes if he hears you call him that. Ah, your grace, Colin called, stepping forward to greet Rupert's father, who had appeared in the doorway. Ah, Colin, my boy, I hope my son isn't making you do all the work. Hello, father, Rupert said. We are just getting ready to get cleaned up for the servants' ball. Yes, yes, it's always... Good to give back to those who serve. You've cleaned up the barn nicely. The staff will begin to set up. Colin, run along and become respectable. Oh, yes, your grace, Colin said, glancing quickly at Rupert. And Rupert, come to the house. A bath has been drawn for you. Of course you realize your father knew, the spirit offered. No, he didn't, the duke said. Oh, yes, he did. But he loved you so much he turned a blind eye. He wanted you to be happy. Yes, happy, Rupert said. He was all about making others happy. I'm sure you jest. What did he do to make Colin and the other servants happy? Throw a little party, which cost him a few shillings here and there. Have two men sweep away the horse shit, because the barn was the best he would do for this lot. The duke grew flushed with colour. My father could have made the lives of those who worked for him on the estate a miserable hell. I've seen it happen one too many times with other estates. The joy he brought with this single event. A poor excuse for a party, if you ask me, the ghost commented. One step above deli meat and cheese and Crackers, punch, and jello salad. What? What's jello salad? Never mind, the ghost responded, wanting to change the subject. He made them feel seen and appreciated, the Duke injected. Now who is lying to who, sir? For the briefest of moment, your father floated down from his pedestal to throw a party in a barn. 
just so he could show that I was a forward-thinking man? This wasn't generosity, sir. It was public relations. Don't want your food spat on? Throw a crumb every now and then to those who cook and serve it. He thought this was a waste, but a necessary evil. That wasn't the point, the Duke said. And before he could finish his thought, the room had changed again, now filled with servants from the estate enjoying food, drink, and the fiddler, who was playing a very merry little jig. The Duke and the Ghost watched as the revellers enjoyed themselves. You really didn't enjoy these parties, the ghost said, pointing to the young Rupert, who stood alone, leaning against one of the horse stalls. It was difficult to enjoy when you were caught between two worlds. I uh, was the Duke's son, and yet I worked in the stables, among the grooms and such. Difficult to strike the right balance is what my father would always warn me about. Oh, yes. Mustn't let them believe they are equal to you, Colin rejoined, Rupert, cleaned up wearing his Sunday best, the waistcoat barely fitting and containing the horseman's broad frame. Oh, Mr. Brackenridge, seems like this party bores you, Colin said, stepping in front of Rupert. Well, boring is such a harsh term, my good man. I'd prefer to say that there are other things I'd rather be doing. Well, perhaps I have a better idea. How about some whiskey in the loft? That sounds more to my high-born taste. <laughs> Lead the way, my most excellent friend. I've seen enough spirit, the Duke said dryly. I want you to know I hear you and acknowledge your feelings on this matter, and I am choosing to ignore them, the ghost said. Let us follow them. The Duke blinked and the barn melted away, and a memory he never could quite forget came into focus. Not a suitable room for the likes of the future duke, I'd say, the spirit commented. And you seem to spend a lot of time up here with Colin. Colin and Rupert sat on a wooden bench in front of a stone fireplace, taking swigs from the whiskey bottle they passed back and forth. Now this is much better, Colin said, holding the bottle in his left hand. Good whiskey, he held up the bottle. A suitable bench, he banged on the bench. A warm fire, he grabbed his poker and adjusted the logs. And a very good friend. Colin reached over, putting his arm around Rupert's neck and pulled him closer. Yes, very good company, Rupert said, following suit and putting his arm around Colin's waist. The two men looked at each other. Unable to decide what to do next. You were in love with him, the spirit said. Yes, replied the duke. He meant the world to me. He was my friend. I loved him dearly. The young Rupert leaned over and rested his head on Colin's shoulder, breathing in the clean scent of his friend. In return, Colin kissed the top of Rupert's head tenderly. Your relationship progressed for quite some time. You spending more and more time in the loft with Colin, sneaking out of your chambers at night. The Duke smiled at the two young men on the bench. Yes, he was the very air I breathed. When he smiled, it was like the sun was shining down upon me. He was my first lover. Not a day would go by when I didn't ache for him. The scene changed, finding the two men asleep in each other's arms. In Colin's bed, it was bliss the duke said to the spirit. Until it changed, the spirit said, turning the duke away to another scene. The spirit, no, no more of this. Ah, oh, when have you had any say in tonight's event? Oh, that's right, never. But my time is almost done, and we have one final memory to explore. I know what it is, and I wish not to relive it. The young Rupert jumped off the mare he was riding and walked it to its stall. Oi, Rupert! It's been some time since I've seen you. Rupert glanced up, both awkward and irritated to be taken by surprise. Oh, Colin, my uh, father has me focusing on other, more important estate matters that require my full attention. I really haven't had the time. Oh, I see. 
completely understand. Uh, pardon my abruptness, sir, Colin said, pain and anger colouring his cheeks. My uh, father felt I needed to be among my own kind. <laughs> I'm sure you understand. How could I possibly be a good replacement for my father when the time had come, if I'm still mucking around? Oh, yo, it is a mucky, a oh, stable servant. <laughs> a right stupid ass I am to think a, a lover's vow. Will you shut up? Rupert hissed. Someone will hear you, and clearly you forget yourself, sir. It meant nothing to me. You mean nothing to me. You were cruel to him, the spirit said to the duke. He offered his heart, and you crushed it under your boot heel. I, I had no choice, the duke said quietly, tears once again welling up in his eyes. I was to be the duke, my... Father made it painfully clear that my nonsense must stop. Yes, the nonsense of being loved unconditionally and seeing what is valued most in this life. Like status and wealth and appearances and, most of all, hiding one's true nature for fear of being rejected by those who wouldn't care a fig if you dropped over dead during one of their garden parties. Yes, sir. We all have choices we must make. Accepting the card you are dealt is one thing, but your cruelty must have been your parting gift to someone who deeply loved you and had given you such happiness. If that is your reward, sir, for those who dared to love you, I greatly pity your enemies. Oh, we are high on... I... I, uh... I... I... well... Colin said, wiping tears away from his eyes with the back of his hand, leaving streaks of mud on his damp face. Yeah, we, uh, we should do this, uh, uh properly. Oh, although it, it clearly means nothing, nothing to you. I release you. When you made that vow to me, we were, uh, yeah, we were de <sighs> different people. Oh, uh, yeah, you would uh, be dis uh, dishonorable for me to expect anything from the new man you've, uh, you've become. You've chucked me away and replaced me. With, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with wealth and the state and title and <laughs> so I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I wish you all, all, all the happiness you uh, may create in uh, all this life. I'm not ashamed to admit that I will continue to pray for you, for, for you every night, sir, as I ask to God keep you safe and bless you and, and, and yours. The Duke stood there, weeping, with his hands covering his face. Naturally, it was what Colin deserved. The spirit said coldly. He clearly forgot himself. After things quieted down, it was most honourable of your father to give Colin the flogging he deserved for his impertinence. Your father saw to that. Your actions, your grace, carry consequences that are suffered upon the innocent. No! <laughs> That's a lie. My father wouldn't. Rupert turned to berate the spirit. But he was alone, in his chambers, back at Brackenridge Hall. That is a lie! Rupert yelled into the darkness. Come back here and face me, spirit! It can't be. Please, tell me it isn't true. Rupert fell to the ground in a faint. <laughs>